Okay, so today we will um, continue with our discussion of gases. So what I wanted to do was to look at one more example of um, solving for gaseous reactants, um, like we did ended yesterday, but I wanna look at one that's a little bit different. Um, let's see. Need a lot of combustion. Okay, let's try this one. All right, so we'll try combustion. Um, so in this particular example, so this is solving for a gaseous reactant. Okay, oops, let me get some in there. Bring this up a little bit bigger. So solving for a gaseous reactant. Okay, so in this one, they're talking about the um, combustion of a hydrocarbon. So combustion. Of pentane, which has the chemical formula C5H12, okay, produces carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at the reaction here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you for combustion. Whenever you see a combustion problem, you write the formula for the hydrocarbon. So pentane is the hydrocarbon. Now in this problem, they tell you it's a liquid. So you can just put L there. If it's combustion, what that means is you're reacting with oxygen gas. Okay. So react it with oxygen gas, O2. And then the products of combustion are typically carbon dioxide and then water. Water is a liquid, okay? So now the next step is to just go ahead and balance it. So we have five carbons on the left side. So we'll put a five here. We've got 12 hydrogens on the left side. We've got two here, so I'll put a six in front of the water, that'll give us 12 hydrogens. And then we just have to do the oxygen. So the oxygens on the left side, we've got two. Um, here we have 10 oxygens and here we have six. So 10 plus six equals 16. So if you put an eight here, eight times two will give you 16 and you'll have your balanced equation, okay? So the, the just like yesterday, the, the starting point of these problems is to just go ahead and write out the equation. If they tell you it's gaseous water, just put G for water. If they tell you it's liquid water, just put L. Okay, so now they say, suppose that 0.240 kilograms of pentane are burned in air at exactly one atmosphere and a temperature of 18.0 degrees C. Calculate the volume of carbon dioxide gas produced. Okay, so similar to what we did yesterday, um, the, the difference was that yesterday when we did the problem, they gave us some information about the product and then we were supposed to find out some information about the reactant. In this example, we're going the opposite. We're gonna look at the we're given information about the reactant and we're gonna find out something about the product. So again, the logic here 
is you you know what are the what what's the material that you're given information about? It's actually two two things, right? You're given some information about pentane. Okay, so that's one piece of information. But then you're also given some information about temperature and pressure. Whenever you're given that kind of information, pressure, temperature, volume, that refers to the gas. We don't talk about solids or liquids in terms of their pressure or their temperature or their volume. Those are gas quantities. So regarding the um, carbon dioxide, what we know is that the pressure is one atmosphere and the temperature is 18 degrees C, 18.0. And this is really referring to the carbon dioxide because the carbon dioxide is a gas. Okay. So now here's the strategy that we can use. We're asked for the volume of carbon dioxide. Thus far, the only equation of state we've been using is the ideal gas law. And the ideal gas law requires, if we're going to find the volume, it requires that we know the pressure, the temperature, but also the number of moles. So we have to find the number of moles of CO2 to be able to get the volume, right? So how do we get the number of moles? Well, we're going to get it from the balanced equation because we're told that we have 0.240 kilograms of the pentane. So if you know how much of that you have, you can figure out how much of this is going to get produced by using the balanced equation. So once we find the moles of carbon dioxide, we can punch that into the ideal gas law and find the volume. Okay. So we'll start by looking at the um, amount of pentane that gave us. So pentane, they gave us the mass, right? This is a mass unit. Now it's a, it's a large number, it's, it's 0.24 kilograms, not 0.24 grams, but 0.24 kilograms, okay? So that's, that's, let's convert it to grams so that we can do our calculations. So 0.240 kilograms, remember kilo is 10 to the three. So times 10 to the three grams, right? So, you know, you can move this over three places and then get rid of the exponent. So this would be equal to 240 grams of C5 H12, okay? And again, if you have the mass of a substance, divide it by its molar mass, and that will give you the number of moles, right? So all we gotta do is divide by the molar mass. So one mole of pentane is what 70, let's see, it'd be 60, 72.17. All right, five carbons, five times 12.01, 12 hydrogens, 12 times 1.01, that's gonna give you 72.17. So 240 divided by 72.17, and you get 3.325 moles of pentane, okay? Now that you got the number of moles of pentane, what you can do is you can use the moles of that and the balanced equation to find the moles of carbon dioxide. So let me just make some room up here and we'll continue this problem up here. Okay, so I'm gonna say we've got 3.325 moles of pentane. And then here's the relationship. We want carbon dioxide, so it's five, right? Five moles of carbon dioxide for every one mole of pentane. Okay, so in a sense, this is the significant, one of the significances of, of greenhouse, greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Um, you get five moles of carbon dioxide out of one mole of pentane. So that's a lot of carbon dioxide. 
it's a hard, it's a large ratio. And for gasoline, gasoline even uses heavier hydrocarbons like C8, C9, C10. So you get eight, nine, 10 carbon dioxides for every, for every um, molecule or for every mole of, of the hydrocarbons. So you get a lot of carbon dioxide out of it. That's why they wanna switch over to electrical instead of combustion. So 3.325 times five is 16.625. I'm just gonna keep an extra, a couple extra sig figs in there. It's not a big deal of CO2. And now you can use your ideal gas law, right? So again, what we're doing is we're connecting two concepts or two chapters. The first one is if you're given the mass of something, divide by the molar mass to get the moles. You're gonna do that with the liquids and solids. Then in terms of the gas, if you wanna find out some amount of the gas volume or pressure, then you're gonna use the ideal gas law. So now that you've got the moles of carbon dioxide, which is a gas, you can use this ideal gas law, okay? So we take 16.625 moles of CO2, and let's, let's plug that into the ideal gas law. PV equals NRT. The question is, what's the volume? Um, volume is typical way to measure how much gas you have. They'll say, you know, we have 20 liters of gas. So that would be NRT over P. Okay, now they told us the pressure, they told us the temperature, so we're set for all that. So 16.625 moles, that's N. Now they gave us the pressure in atmosphere, right? So if they gave us the pressure in atmosphere, that means we're gonna use the R value that's in atmospheres. <clears throat> so 82057. Atmosphere liters, a lot of units in there, right? Four units in that constant. And then let's do the temperature, 273 plus 18.0. So 273, that'd be 291.15. It's perfectly fine to leave extra sig figs throughout, just round it at the end. And then, oh, this is silly, it's one atmosphere, right? So we're just gonna add it, divide it by one. Remember, it says it's, it's exact value, so that means it's unlimited sig figs. So, um, you know, just to remind you, I, met, I made this sort of mention yesterday, if you're interested about STP, that if you're at zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, one mole of a gas is 22.4 liters. We're not that far off from zero degrees C, you know, 273 versus 291, they're pretty close. And we are at one atmosphere. So if you have 16 moles of it, it'd be 16 times 22.4, right? So 16 times 22.4, you get like 358 liters. So our answer should be, you know, a few hundred liters, three to 400 liters. So let's plug it in and see what we get. 16.625 times 0.082057 times 291.15, and it's 397, rounding it to three sig figs, 397 liters. Okay, so there's your answer, there's your volume, right? You have more than one mole, right? One mole would be 22.4 liters, approximately, not exactly, because we're not really at 273, we're a little bit off 273 but we're right on one atmosphere. So it's gonna be a little bit off of it. So if one mole gives you 22 liters, 16 moles is gonna give you, actually it's closer to 400 than it is to 300, it's 397 liters. So it's a pretty large value, okay? That's a big volume, 397 liters. And again, that's, that's kind of the, you know, one of the issues of why they wanna replace hydrocarbons and replace petroleum and all of that in combustion, um, and replace it with other types of powers, whether it be hydroelectric or wind power or solar power or nuclear power, um, re replace combustion as a method of generating electrical energy. Okay, so there we go. All right, so that is um, a second example of that type of problem. That one, um, 
that one we had to balance the equation. If you recall yesterday, the one we looked at yesterday, we didn't have to balance the equation. It was already balanced. It was calcium carbonate turns into carbon dioxide and calcium oxide, the lime problem. So as you go through these, you'll see that you know, you're probably gonna have to do one that has a combustion in it. Okay, so that's um, reactions with gaseous reactants and products. So the next topic coming up is called gas mixtures. And there's two types of problems that you're gonna do in this section. The um, first one is calculating mole fractions, which is very straightforward. So I'm just gonna go through how to do mole fractions first, and then we'll look at gas mixtures in a moment. Mole fractions are easy. So let's start about, let's, let's start with mole fractions. Okay. The symbol for a mole fraction is typically a, it's not really an X, it's, it's the Greek letter X, Xi. <laughs> um, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it properly, but it looks like a cursive or a script X, looks something like that, and it's uppercase, okay? And then typically it has a subscript underneath it, so like A or B, for example, it might say X, B or X, C. So those are the symbols that are used for it. And the name is actually tells you what it is. It's a mole fraction. It's a fraction of moles divided by moles. So, you know, the mole fraction for A would be the moles of A, whatever A is. A could be carbon dioxide. It could be nitrogen. Typically we use mole fractions with gases. It is technically possible to use it with liquids or solids, but it's more commonly used with gases or at least I should say it is definitely used with gases. And then in the denominator, you'd have the total number of moles. So I'm just gonna write total moles, okay? So let me show you an example. Suppose I've got three gases, A, B, and C. And it, for gas A, you've got, you know, I'll make the numbers simple, one mole of gas A. And for B, you've got more, you've got two moles. And for C, you've also got two moles, okay? So you have some mixture of gases. So we could calculate out of that the mole fraction of A. So this would just be equal to the moles of A divided by the total number of moles. So that would be moles of A plus the moles of B plus the moles of C, right? You just add up all the moles, that's all it is. It's a fraction. So you'd get one mole, and then let's just do the arithmetic. One plus two plus two is five, right? So you divide that by five moles. So you just add them all together. So you get a number, no units, right? It would just be 0.2, right? One over five is 0.2. So that's how you calculate the mole fraction. And again, if you wanted to calculate the mole fraction of B, you could do that too, right? You just say, you know, two moles, right? Because that would be the number of moles of B the total number is five and you get 0.4. So the mole fraction is a unitless value. It's gotta be, you know, can't be greater than one, right? Cause there's no way to have one part out of a total be more than the total. So you can't have greater than one. And, you know, C same thing. It'd be point, it'd be two moles of C. That's how much of that we have divided by five moles. So you get 0.4 again, right? So what you can notice one thing is that if you add them all up together, so if you add the mole fraction of A plus the mole fraction of B plus the mole fraction of C. So if you add up all the mole fractions together, you get one, right? So the total is got to be equal to one, right? And so that's one aspect of mole fractions that you notice. Okay, so that's, that's mole fraction. Now, typically, let's do an example where you've got a real materials in here. Typically, you're given the masses and then you got to calculate the moles. So let's say that we've got a mixture. So this is a mixture of gases. And we'll talk more about them in a moment. So let's make it, you know, I'm going to make the numbers relatively simple. Let's say we've got uh, 88, 
0.02 grams of carbon dioxide. Okay, a little over 88 grams. And let's say, and again, let's write down that these are gases. Okay, let's do nitrogen. So let's say for nitrogen, uh, you've got 280.10 grams of nitrogen. Okay. Um, and then let's try um, oxygen. Six, four, so let's do 128. grams of oxygen gas. Okay, and what we wanna do in this example is we wanna calculate the mole fraction of each gas. Okay, so let's take a look. How do we go about doing that? Let's try um, figuring out the number of moles of each. Remember, the mole fraction is the number of moles of the gas divided by the total number of moles. So how do we find the number of moles? Well, if you're given the mass of something, you divide it by its molar mass, right? So let's figure out our molar masses. So let's do the carbon dioxide first. Carbon is 12.01. Oxygen is 16, so you get 44.01 grams per mole. So there's your molar mass of carbon dioxide. Let's do the nitrogen. Well, nitrogen is 14.01, so two times 14.01, and you get 28.02. Okay, there's your nitrogen. Let's do oxygen. 2 times 16, right? Okay, so there's our molar mass. And remember, if you have the mass of something, you want to find its moles, you just divide by the molar mass. So in this mixture, even though they give us masses, we can convert those to moles quite, quite readily. So let's do it. Let, I'm going to use these numbers up here. So I'm going to multiply the mass of carbon dioxide by 1 mole per 44. 0 0.01 grams, right? Divide by the molar mass. So if you take those two numbers, you get 2.000 moles of CO2. Um, so let's do the same thing for nitrogen. So times one mole per 28.02. I'm going to make them, sorry, I'm going to change this number a little bit. Grams. Okay, so 280 divided by 28.02, that's 10.00. And then let's do the oxygen. The oxygen is 128, right? So times one mole divided by 32 grams. So that's 4.000 moles of O2. Okay. So we got all our moles here. Let me just check something real quick here. Okay, good, we're set. All right, so let's take a look now. What's the next step? Mole fractions, right? So let's calculate the mole fraction of each material. So let's do the mole fraction of carbon dioxide first. So that would be the moles of carbon dioxide, which is 2.000. divided by the total number of moles. Now, the numbers are pretty good. These are easy to add, right? So I'm just gonna add them up. The total number of moles would be 2.000 plus 10.00 plus 4.00, so 16.00, right? Okay, so what do you get? 0.125, no units, right? I almost put units there, but there's no units for that one, okay? So that's 0.125. Let's do the mole fraction of the next one, which is nitrogen. 
So nitrogen is 10 moles. And then the total number is just 16. Okay, so what is that? Five eighths, 0.625. And then the last one is oxygen. So the mole fraction of oxygen would be four divided by the total 16. And that would be 0.25. Again, no units, right? Now there's a way to check this. I just did all these calculations in my head um, and I could have made a mistake very easily because I make mistakes when I add things and divide things all the time. So let's add them up. So if you take 0.625 and you add 0.125, you get 0.75. And if you add 0.25 to that, you get 1.000, right? So it looks like we're set. It looks like it added up to one. So that, you know, if it adds up to one, the chances that you made a mistake are, it's not zero. You could make, still make a, you know, you can make two mistakes and the errors cancel each other. But the chances are pretty low. If you get 1.00, those calculations are pretty good. So there we go. So that's how you calculate the mole fractions um, of a mixture of gases, okay? Very simple, it's just doing mole calculations. Now, the reason, the reason that we um, do those calculations in this chapter has to do with what's called, typically it's called Dalton's, not everybody calls it Dalton's, but typically it's called Dalton's law of partial pressures. Okay, Dalton's law of partial pressure. So Dalton's, Dalton's law of partial pressures, there's different ways to write this, but essentially what it says is the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of each gas. Okay, so what I mean by that is imagine that you've got some container. Okay, and you put, I'm just gonna do it with two gases just so you can kind of see the idea. So suppose I put a gas in there, which I'll represent as these shaded circles. Okay, so there's the first gas, it's in there. And suppose I have some way of measuring the pressure. And let's say it comes out to 0.2 atmospheres. Okay, so there's your pressure of the first gas. So I have some way of measuring it using some device. And then I put in another gas. So this gas is gonna be open circles. Okay, and suppose I measure the pressure of that gas and it comes out to 0.1 atmosphere, oops, 0.1 atmosphere. Okay. What Dalton's law of partial pressure says is that the total pressure is the sum of the individual pressures. So it'd be the pressure of the shaded in circles plus the pressure of the open circles. Just add the two of them together, okay? So that would be uh, 0.2 atmospheres plus 0.1 atmosphere. So it'd get 0.3 atmosphere. So it's kind of a cool, um, useful relation because it's so simple. What it says is, look, I mix two gases together, the total pressure, you just add them up. So if one of them is three atmospheres and the other one's two, just add them, you got five atmospheres total. And so the container can't tell the difference between gases. So it would, it would, it would, 
experience the total pressure as just being the addition of the two, the sum of the individual pressures, which is really neat. Okay, it's very useful. Um, and there are reasons why this law works. It's, it's related to the kinetic molecular theory of gases, um, but we won't go through all of that. So that's in, in a nutshell what Dalton's law of partial pressures is. Now, you know, to, to kind of drive home the significance of this, you know, without studying it, we wouldn't necessarily think that that's true, right? So for example, um, think of colors. If you take something that's red and something that's blue, the color of mixing them together, like two dyes, like food colorings, you can't, you know, like we know what the color would be based on like experiment, but you can't just add the colors together and get the sum of the colors, right? Like, like when you add two colors, you get a different color. And so it's not like instantaneously predictable um, without experiment, what, what, what the color you would get after all. And um, you know, another example that might be like density, right? If you take two things that have different densities and you mix them together, the density of the material at the end is not gonna be the sum of the density. So for example, if I take some water and mix it with some vodka, mix it together. The density is not going to be the density of water, which is one gram per milliliter, plus the density of uh, the vodka, which is 0.8 grams per milliliter. It wouldn't be 1.8. It wouldn't be more dense than either of the individual ones. So, so the fact that just adding the pressures works tells us something about how gases are different than liquids or solids. Okay. So let's take a look then. Um, the next step is to take a look at a problem which has us calculate these partial pressures. So the word, the term partial pressure, all that means is the pressure of one of the gases, okay? So if I say the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, I just mean what is the pressure of carbon dioxide, okay? So typically, I mean, there's, there's many different types of problems you can you can put together here, but let me give you a couple of equations just to kind of show you how this works, okay? If you want the, to find the total pressure, all you gotta do is add the pressures of the individual gases. Very simple, right? But suppose you wanna find the pressure of one of the gases you would need to know the total pressure, right? So if I wanna find the pressure, the partial pressure of B, I would need to know what the total pressure is. So the partial pressure of B would be the total pressure minus the partial pressure of A and then minus the partial pressure of C, right? That makes sense, right? But there's another way to do it too. There's a way to find the partial pressure of one of the gases just from the total pressure, not from the pressures of the other gases. So it looks like this. The partial pressure of A is equal to the mole fraction of A times the total pressure. Okay. All you got to do is take the partial pressure of that gas that you're interested in and multiply it by the total pressure, okay? Now, the reason that this works is the ideal gas law. Essentially what happens is, um, what happens is if you take a look at the ideal gas law, let me see if I can show you this. So if we're interested in the pressure of gas A in a mixture, so it's in a volume, that would be equal to the moles of that gas N sub A times RT. But keep in mind, when we're talking about mixtures, the gases are in the same container, right? They're not in separate containers. A mixture is where things are together. So they're going to be in the same volume. Their volumes are going to be the same because the volume of the gas is the volume of the container, right? Gases, gases expand to fill their container. So the, when we would say, what's the volume of CO2? We just look at the volume of the container. And the same is true with the temperature. When you mix gases together, they will come to the same temperature. So I don't have to say VA, meaning the volume of gas A, 
or TA, meaning the temperature of gas A, because the temperature is going to be the same no matter what gas we're talking about in a mixture. So that follows then that the total pressure times its volume is equal to the total number of moles times RT. Now, this equation is not obvious, right? We haven't proven it, but experimentally, it appears to be true, OK? There is a way to prove it um, mathematically. And experimentally, we can test it and see that it's true. But the total pressure, T for total, sorry, I'm using a different notation here to save space. The total pressure times the volume of the container is equal to the number of moles, total number of moles times RT. So suppose I say the following. Suppose I say, let's take the volume in the first equation, in this one right here. The volume would be N sub A times RT over P sub A, right? Does that make sense? And then I could do the same thing with this one over here. I could say the volume here is N total. I'll, I guess I'll write it out times RT over P total. Now I have space so I can write that out, okay? So if you look at it, both of those are the ideal gas law, right? They're just written for, um, for different situations. One is for one gas and the other one is for all the gases mixed together. Again, here's our picture. You've got all these gases in here. They're all mixed together. They're all in the same volume. They're all in the same temperature. They just have different pressures, okay? All right, so now let's do the following. Let's, let's rearrange this again, and I'm gonna write it in terms of P sub A. So now I'll have N sub A RT over V, and then P total would be N total RT over V. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a ratio. Let's do a little ratio. Ratio is where you just divide one thing by another. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the ratio of P sub A over P total. Okay, I'm just taking the pressure of the gas A divided by the total pressure. What you would get is N sub A RT over V, right? Divided by N total RT over V. Pretty cool, that's relative. Now, now look what happens though. The R's cancel and the T's cancel, and the V's cancel, and all you have is N sub A over N total. Well, guess what? That's called the mole fraction of A. All that is is the mole fraction of A, is the moles of the gas A divided by the total number of moles. So now I can write this equation in the following way. P A over P total is mole fraction of A. So then I'm just gonna multiply both sides by P total. So I would have mole fraction of A times P total. It's really simple, okay? There's our result. So I just wanted to show that to you. Just occasionally I wanna show you where we get these equations because sometimes it's not obvious. There it is, there's that equation right there. So all you gotta do is be able to use this equation. But we've shown that, we've shown where it comes from, right? That's where that equation comes from. It's just by taking the ideal gas law for the gas, for the mixture of gases, taking a ratio, and then you end up with that. So we can use that. So let's take a look at an example. This is one of the Alex problems. Okay, so in this particular problem, what they tell us, so this is calculating the partial pressure. In a gas mixture. So what do they do? They tell us you've got a tank. So we have a 10.0 liter tank at 11.9 degrees C filled with 6.48 grams of dinitrogen difluoride. Well, that's a cool molecule. OK, 
gas and 3.05 grams of chlorine pentafluoric gas. Okay. Okay, so what they want us to do is to do three things. One, calculate the mole fraction of each gas. Two, calculate the partial pressure of each gas. And then three, calculate the total pressure in the tank. Okay, so let's take these one at a time. We've got all the numbers here. Okay, so let's, let's figure out what the mole fractions are. So first we gotta find the moles of each gas. Okay, so let's start. We've got 6.48 grams of dinitrogen difluoride. So that's 6.48 grams of nit dinitrogen, two nitrogens, difluoride, two fluorides. Okay, we have to divide that by the molar mass. So let's figure out what the molar mass is. There are two nitrogens and two nitro, two fluorine, sorry. So that comes out to 66.02. So times one mole over 66.02 grams, okay? Divide by the molar mass. So divide that by, and take the reciprocal. So it looks like it's a, a relatively small number, 0 0.09815. Okay, dinitrogen difluoride. And then you've got 3.05 grams of chlorine pentafluoride, so ClF5. Let's divide that by the molar mass. So one chlorine, 35.45, plus five fluorines, five times 19, and you get 130.45 grams. So 3.05, again, small number, 0 0.0234. I should have one more digit in there, 0 0.02338. Okay, so you got the moles of each. Um, if we're gonna do the mole fraction, we have to have the total number of moles. So let's add them together. So plus 0 0.09815 and you get 0.1215 moles. Okay, so now we can get the mole fractions quite easily. The mole fraction of the first one would just be the moles of the first one, 0 0.09815 over the total, which is 0 0.1215. So 0 0.09815 divided by 0 0.1215 is 0 0.8078. So there's your mole fraction of the first one. Let's do the second one. The second one is 0 0.02338 over 0 0.1215. So 0 0.02338 over 0 0.1215 and you get 0 0.1924. Okay, remember there's no units in mole fractions. Okay, so there we go. So that first thing is taken care of, we've gotten the mole fraction. The second question is how do we find the partial pressure of each gas, okay? So now we wanna find the partial pressure of each gas. Now for this one, 
we're going to use the ideal gas law because we've got a lot of information here. We're told the volume. So we have the volume of the tank. We're also told the temperature. We've got T, right? So if you know the number of moles of each gas and you know the volume and you know the temperature, you can find the pressure, the pressure of, of each gas. So the pressure of the first gas, N2F2, would just be NRT over P, or, I mean, NRT over V. Just take PV equals NRT and just rearrange it for P. So I'm not gonna put the units in here. I'm just gonna go ahead and put the numbers in just to save some space here. So we're gonna do the N2F2 first. So that's this one right here. So that's the mole fraction, but we just want the moles right there. Okay, so point 09815. Again, the pressures, um, what do we want it to be and what units do we want? Um, let's do atmospheres, okay? So if we do atmospheres, we would use 0 0.082057, right? So that's R, N, R. T is 11.9, so we wanna add that. So 11.9 plus 273.15, 285.05. Okay, divide that by the volume, which is 10.0. And that's gonna give us the partial pressure of N2F2, okay? So 0 0.09815 times 0 0.082057 times 285.05 divided by 10. And it looks like you get 0.2296 atmospheres. So there's your first one. Now, remember it's NRT over V and they're in the same container. They're at the same temperature. So that means that if you have a smaller number of moles, you should have a smaller pressure, right? The smaller this is, the smaller this is gonna be. So now we're gonna use this number for the second gas, okay? So the pressure of ClF5, again, NRT over V. So 0 0.02338, so there's your N, 0 0.082057, there's your R, and then 285.05, there's your T, and then we're gonna divide that by the volume, which is 10.0. Okay, so NRT over V, so point 0.02338 times 0.082057 times 285.05 divided by 10, and you get a smaller pressure, a smaller partial pressure, 05469 atmosphere. Again, I use the value of R that has liter atmospheres, so we're going to get atmospheres out of it. So there's our two partial pressures. Okay, so the last step then is to find the total pressure. Okay, the total pressure is pretty simple now, right? Because we've got the individual pressures, we've got the partial pressures. So now we can apply, see right now all we've done is the ideal gas law, but now we can apply the law of partial pressures which says the total pressure is just the individual pressures added together. So dinitrogen difluoride plus the partial pressure of chlorine pentafluoride. Just add those two together. So that would be 0.2296 atmospheres plus 0.05469 atmospheres. Now, all the numbers they gave us or three sig figs, I think. Um, I erased them, but 6.48 grams is three sig figs. So right there, that limits it to three sig figs. So we're gonna round it to three. So I'm gonna take 0 0.2296, I'm gonna add 0 0.05469, and I'm just gonna round it to three sig figs. So 0 0.2, Eight four 
atmospheres. And there you go. Okay, and there's your answer, 0.284. And there you go, all right. So really just two things you're doing here. One is just using the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, finding the pressure of each gas from NRT over V. And then the second thing is applying the um, law of partial pressures where you're just adding the partial pressures together to get your total pressure, okay? There's not a whole lot in that section, um, just those two types of problems, um, but there you go. All right, let me see what here, see if there's any silliness going on here. Um, hmm. Yeah, okay, 0.248, good. All right, so that's gas mixtures. We only have one section to talk about, which is 10.6, the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Um, there are, it looks like there's three different types of problems that you have to work on there. So let's talk a little bit about that. And then next Tuesday, we'll continue talking about that one, kinetic molecular theory of gases. Okay, so 10.6 kinetic molecular theory of gases. Okay, kind of a cool topic. This, you know, this is something you could spend a uh, half a semester on this particular little section here because it's so rich, it's, it's, it's so much information in it. But we're just gonna do a little survey of it. So here's the idea. We're gonna start with a kind of a picture of what a gas is. So we'll start with a simple situation. So let's imagine that you have a container, a gas tank, and we introduce a gas into it. So we put some gas into here. Our picture of a gas is that there are widely spaced molecules, large numbers of them. So I'm only gonna draw in a few, but imagine a mole, six times 10 to the 23rd, huge numbers of these, okay? They're very widely spaced. So essentially what we're claiming is that if you took one of them, the nearest one might be on average over here. Now look how that big that distance is. So there's the distance between the two particles on average, that's what their distance would be compared to the size, compare that to the size of the particles. See how small they are? So they're very far away from each other on average. And that's what we find with gases like air is that on average, these molecules, which are really tiny, are actually pretty far apart. And that's why, that's why, they're, very, that's why they're, they're gases. That's why they're not very dense, right? The density of a gas is so low because they're so far apart from each other. For things to be high density, they have to be close to each other. Remember we called solids and liquids condensed materials. So they're close to each other, they're condensed. Okay, so these things are far, but, but not are they just far apart from each other they're moving, right? So I'm gonna use little arrows to represent it. So this one is moving in this direction. And this one here is moving in that direction. And this one here is moving in that direction. So they're moving, they're moving pretty randomly, right? Some are moving one direction, others are moving a different direction. There's no real rhyme or reason to their movement, it's, 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 random, and I'm gonna use these little arrows to represent their directions of their motions. Okay, so some are moving to the left, some are moving to the right, some are moving up, some are moving down. They're moving all around, okay? Now, in the kinetic molecular theory of gases, the motions are dependent on temperature, meaning the faster they, I'm sorry, the hotter the gas is, the higher the temperature, the faster they move on average, okay? So 
gas molecules are widely spaced. Okay, on average, gas molecules move randomly, meaning they're not moving in a particular direction. They're moving in all directions. And the speed with which they move of these molecules increases with temperature. Okay, what that means is if they're at a higher temperature, they move faster. But there's another aspect of this, which is the speed also depends on mass. In fact, molar mass. The heavier a molecule is, the slower it moves. Okay. And the alternative to that would be the converse would be the, the lighter it is, the faster it moves, right? Heavier moves slower. Now we can take a look at that from the perspective of the kinetic energy, right? E sub K, kinetic energy. We talked about that right at the beginning of chapter, uh, chapter five, thermochemistry. If you have a particle that's moving, the kinetic energy is one half times the mass of the particle times the velocity squared, okay? So here's what happens. For a given temperature, the kinetic energy is the same for all gases. Okay, now that's an important statement. What I'm saying is that if you know the temperature, you know the kinetic energy of a gas and it doesn't matter what the gas is, you know what the kinetic energy is, okay? So we know what that is. But some gases are heavier than others, right? So if a gas is heavier, that means the mass is larger, right? Greater. But if the mass is greater, the velocity has to be smaller. Why? Because the product has got to be equal to E sub K. So if, if this doesn't change for a given temperature, but this does, I make something heavier, that means that the velocity has to be smaller because the product of those together has to be equal to the kinetic energy. So here's what we find then. Faster molecules have higher temperature. Okay, so the higher the temperature, the faster they move and lower molar masses. Okay, so the, the, the lower the molar mass, the faster it's gonna move. Slower molecules are for lower temperatures. So the lower the temperature is, the slower a molecule is gonna move. And they have higher molar masses. Okay, so those are the two relationships that you should, you know, remember. The, the greater the temperature, the faster they move. The heavier they are, or the larger the molar mass, the slower they move. Those are the two variables that affect the speed of a molecule, temperature and molar mass. Okay, and the reason behind that is because what's been determined is the kinetic energy of gas molecules is determined by the temperature. So if something's heavier, it still has the same kinetic energy as something that's lighter. But since it's heavier, it's gotta move slower, right? Think about pushing a bus compared to pushing a bicycle. It's much easier to push a bicycle fast 
than it is to push a bus fast, right? Because a bus is heavier. The heavier they are, the slower it's going to move. Okay. So um, let's see. Just about out of time here. So I don't want to go over. So um, what we'll do on Tuesday is we'll just kind of crunch through these problems. We'll look at the graphs. We'll look at the numerical calculations for 10.6. Um, that might take a half hour. It might take a little bit longer though. So we'll see if we finish before the end of the period, we'll, um, we'll move on to chapter six. If it takes the whole period on Tuesday, then we'll just finish that up. And then on Wednesday, we'll start with, with chapter six. Okay. All right. So we're almost done with the section, almost done with the chapter, I should say. Um, Reach out to me if you have any questions. Have a great day and a great end of the week and a great weekend. And I want to thank you all for um, hanging in there and good luck with everything, okay? Professor, can I ask you a quick question? <clears throat> Hold on one By second. any chance, uh, 